thank you to the organization for inviting me to present some of the interesting things they are doing uh, in the lab. So let me start with a disclosure. I have no commercial interests in what I will tell you. Uh, all the work on Usher syndrome I contributed to is purely academic. And the DFNA 9 work is patented. I am an inventor on that patent, but it's all still in the hands of our university hospital. So let me start by introducing the types of disorders that uh, we are working on. So we call them collectively autogenetic disorders. Uh, worldwide, 430 million people on estimates suffer from a degree of hearing loss that we call uh, disabling, which means more than 35 decibel uh, threshold difference compared to normal hearing individuals. And in about half these cases, we suspect or we know there is an underlying genetic defect. But hearing loss is genetically also very heterogeneous. There's more than 100 genes involved. In every gene, multiple mutations can occur. And in many cases, we suspect a genetic uh, etiology, but we don't know the exact gene. So for the view of this presentation, it's good to know that we can distinguish these disorders also by the fact that if they are syndromic, so combined with phenotypes in other organs, or non-syndromic, and they have different modes of inheritance. But for all these hearing disorders, everything basically is the same. Hearing aids and cochlear implants are a nice tool to help. They can really help patients converse in a one-on-one -on -one situation. But for example, on parties, noisy environments or professional environments, they do fall short. So we hope to offer our patients something better in the future. So I specifically selected the title semi-personalized medicine, which may seem a bit weird on a conference that is about personalized medicine. But with genetic therapies, yeah, becoming a reality or are a reality for some uh, very lucky individuals already, we also see a significantly rising cost of these therapies. And when I think about personalized medicine and genetics, I think about correcting a mutation of a specific individual. And that's so expensive, there is no market potential for that, especially if mutations are extremely rare or ultra rare, as we call them. So then it will be truly personalized, and that's just not a sustainable way to treat patients. So it's what I call semi-personalized medicine. It is our goal to find the right balance between uh, market potential, treating a number of patients in a way that is better than what we can do with a completely generalized therapy. So the technology that I will present to you today, we call antisense oligonucleotides, and they offer a very interesting treatment opportunity for inherited disorders and many other types of disorders as well, because it does not involve genetic manipulation. It's basically the same technology that's also used in the mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, only we use a very, very small uh, piece of information and then they use much bigger pieces of information. So the antisense oligonucleotide, uh, abbreviated as ASO in short or sometimes AON in the Netherlands, they are chemically modified pieces of RNA or RNA DNA molecules, usually 15 to 25 nucleotides in length. They are complementary to what we call the pre-mRNA, and they've already proven to be safe in many animal studies, and also several are already approved by the FDA and EMA. So the technology and the chemistry is ready to use in patients. So what happens with this technology? So normally, we have a gene, I will show you here on the left screen for you, and the gene encodes the information that builds up the components of our body. And the gene is transcribed and an mRNA is formed and this mRNA actually uh, is the, the building map for the proteins that make up all our organs. So if we would modulate the DNA, everything, if something would go wrong, it could be detrimental. But with the AONs, they can actually nicely bind in a sequence specific manner the mRNA and thereby we can interfere with the production of the proteins while keeping the DNA intact. We can do this in two ways. We can alter pre-mRNA splicing. I will explain that in a minute. Or we can target specific mRNA molecules for degradation to avoid the production of a protein. And that's the second part of this presentation. So I selected two examples, one on Usher syndrome and one of the DFNA9. Both have distinct methods of inheritance and distinct ASO actions that we levy to get a treatment to our patients. So let me start with Usher syndrome. Usher syndrome is the most common cause of inherited deaf blindness in men. It affects about 1 in 20,000 individuals. We still call it a rare condition, but it's more frequent than you would imagine. The inheritance pattern is autosomal recessive, which means that the patient inherits an inactive copy of the gene from mother and from father and has no ability to produce a functional protein for this gene anymore. There are many genes involved and also several different clinical representations. 
So in terms of personalized medicine, we can already go to the genetic origin instead of Usher syndrome general treatment, but we go even a bit further. So these patients are born with inherited uh, or congenital hearing loss, I should say. So they're born uh, moderately hearing impaired to severely hearing impaired. This is a developmental defect. We think there's not a lot that we can do about that. They get fitted with a hearing aid and later on a cochlear implant. But somewhere during life, uh, around the age of 18 to 20, they also develop night blindness. And there's also a specific subset of patients that only develops this night blindness due to mutations in one of the usher associated genes. And this blindness progresses into a severe legal blindness, as we call it, where patients basically only see light but do not have any ability to see sharp, even within the center of their eye. So they cannot read, they cannot see faces anymore. But you can see also there's quite a big time between the onset of the first symptoms and the actual complete blindness. Okay. So in that time, we have a window of opportunity to deliver treatment to our patients, and hopefully we can prevent or delay the progression of this disease to ensure that these people uh, do not lose also their second sensory system and have some means of communication and participating in society. So to show you what we have uh, been developing in terms of therapeutic strategy, let me start with the most common cause of Usher syndrome, and that are mutations in the gene that we call H2A. And in this gene, there are over 600 different mutations described. And by mutations in this gene, about seven, 170 people develop Usher syndrome, and there is another approximately 250,000 worldwide that develop the non-syndromic vision loss. So there is definitely a need and a market for a therapy. But this gene, OSH2A, is also extremely large. It's one of the largest genes in our body, and it far exceeds the delivery options for the classical gene augmentation. So delivering a healthy copy of the gene is just technically not possible at this time. So to offer our patients some sort of treatment, we decided to see if we could do something with the antisense oligonucleotide, and specifically with the option to use splice modulation. So I already explained to you before, so we have the DNA that encodes our genes, and these genes are comprised of, oh, wrong button, of what we call introns and exons. So the exons you see here, they contain the information that builds up the proteins, and this intronic information is removed in the mRNA, and we call that splicing. And with these antisense oligonucleotides, we can actually interfere with this mechanism of splicing, and thereby, for example, have this mutated exon Y here in the picture, being excluded from the mature transcript, so this information is no longer translated into a protein. And this can be very helpful to exclude mutant exons in some conditions. We can use this to correct defects in pre-mRNA splicing that are much more frequent than we thought, I guess, five to 10 years ago. And also we can use them to exclude parts of the, what we call pseudo exons, so information that actually should not be there at all. So for Usher syndrome, we thought this exon skipping could maybe work, and that's because, as you can see in the picture, this protein, as is shown here in the graphic representation, is comprised of two types of protein domains that occur quite frequently. So we have protein domains in green, there are 10 of them, and we have another type of domain in blue, there are, I think, 23 of them. And we thought, well, do we need all 10? Do we need all 23? How important are they really? So because if we look at our patient situation, for example, in exon 13, our primary target, we have two founder mutations and 24 more unique pathogenic variants, and all of these mutations inactivate the protein, and of course this protein is not functional. But what if we could remove this mutated exon and just lose this little piece of information? A theoretical protein would look like this, and you can see with the arrow there's a few of these green domains lost, but the difference is not a lot. We have about 95% of the protein remaining, and we thought this could be functional. And if so, this would be a huge therapeutic opportunity for quite a large subset of patients. And I think this is also a nice way to touch upon why I selected semi-personalized medicine uh, in my title, because we have two founder mutations, and by targeting a complete exon, we actually can develop a therapy for patients with 26 different pathogenic variants that are known so far. So of course we investigated if this protein is functional. We started with some in silico predictions before we put a lot of money in animal models. And these in silico predictions suggest that the protein domain structure changes a little bit. So you can see here these 10 blue domains, uh, five of them are gone. Actually one hybrid domain is formed in the middle. And in the bottom panel you can see that this hybrid domain 
is folding nicely, not exactly as it should be, but there are no reactive groups, so our bioinformatician says, well, at least it's not, probably not detrimental. So we thought, okay, let's test this then in vivo, see if this protein is really functional. So normally, one would go to a mouse model, but if we have a mouse model where we knock out the RH2A gene, it's hardly vision impaired. Around the age of 20 months, there is some gradual and mild vision decline. But of course, we didn't want to wait 20 months for every experiment. So that's why we started looking into alternatives, and that's where the zebrafish came in, because the H2A gene and protein structure are highly conserved in zebrafish. And we started first at making a knockout model that resembles the mutations that we see in patients. And we used CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce a mutation in exon 13 and established our first H2A mutant zebrafish. And this zebrafish indeed has an early retinal phenotype. And when I say early, I actually mean the larvae. So I guess you can imagine this as a zebrafish, but most of our work is actually focused on this larval zebrafish, which is five days post-fertilization. So five days after the embryo starts dividing, it looks like that. And you can see also very nicely here this big black eye. So it already has a very functional retina that we can study. And this really boosts the timeline of all of our research. So we introduced this mutation and we measured retinal function among several other things. You can see here, this is electrophysiology data. So our wild type has a very nice electronic response on a light stimulus. And in our mutant, this is reduced approximately by half. So we have a model that we can use to test therapies. So that's great. So then of course, we designed these antisense therapies. So first, we designed them for zebrafish and later also for the human H2A, exon 13. So we designed them in a way to mask this exon 13 so it's no longer included in the transcript. Oh, now here I see that something is wrong in my picture. So there was supposed to be a slide here showing that we can actually remove them on transcript, but these bands somehow appeared I don't know where from. But the sequencing is still correct. We were able to remove specifically this exon 13. So the sequence of H2A exon 12 in zebrafish is immediately followed by exon 14. So we were able to remove this part from the protein coding information in our animal model. And then we started to look what happens. So we made sections of these larval zebrafish and first looked at the localization of this usher protein in our wild type and added it uh, healthy zebrafish retina. You can see this localization here in green, so it's in the photoreceptors that are depicted here in a very precise region just between the cell body and the actual light-sensitive parts of this photoreceptor cell. And we have introduced a red staining to mark this area. Looking at our mutants in the central panel, all this green staining is gone, so the protein is gone and we are indeed looking at a mutant. And in the right panel we have our antisense oligonucleotide treated zebrafish where we expect the protein to look like this. And when we use an antibody directed against this part of the protein, you can nicely see here, and I think there are some lines, that the protein is indeed returning. So this looks promising. We can lose this part of information and the protein comes back to the place where it should be. But of course, the main question is, is it also functional? So we tested that again with electrophysiology. And here you can see in the black line and the green line are the healthy fish. Green are the treated ones actually. Here in red is our mutant, and in purple we have our control-treated animal. And this picture nicely shows that with our exon skipping hypothesis, we can indeed restore retinal function in a zebrafish. So then we thought about what's next. So our zebrafish model shows our ID works, but it's still an ID and it's a zebrafish. So what happened at that time were a lot of things in parallel, and one of the things is that we licensed this uh, to ProQR Therapeutics. They developed a molecule called QR421A, now brand name Ultaversin, to be used in patients. And they did a lot of experiments uh, on this molecule, showing that it's safe, showing that it's effective in human cells. So you can see that, for example, here, this is in uh, human photoreceptor cells that are cultured in a Petri dish. So this is a band, a product about from how H2A exon 13 should normally be. And here are bands indicated that we were able to remove this exon 13 from the transcript in the human cell. They also investigated where these molecules would end up if we inject them in the eye. So they inject them just in the vitreous humor of several animal models and now also of patients. And they end up nicely, as you can see in the red staining here in all layers of our retina specifically here the ONL, which are the photoreceptor layer. 
And also, these molecules are active for quite a long time. So the right panel is a study done in mice showing that this exon skipping event from this antisense oligonucleotide lasts for over 200 days. But all these studies are focusing on the ability to show exon skipping. And from these data, ProQR actually started a therapeutic trial in March 2019. First patients were dosed, and now they are already in a phase two, three trial. So when the trial was started, this was the very first clinical trial for treatment of H2A-associated blindness, and I think it still is today. And it's also very interesting that this trial was approved by the EMA and FDA to be conducted, but purely based on proof of concept in zebrafish. So of course, mice and uh, higher uh, animal models were involved, but the effectiveness of our therapy was only shown in zebrafish. So that step from fish immediately to man can boost therapy development and is shown to be very promising. And of course, the nicest part was when we were in the beginning of the lockdown behind our computer when they presented the interim data showing that actually vision improved in all patients treated. And at the end of the project uh, or the phase one, two trial, they confirmed that all participants had a visual improvement on multiple parameters. So this therapy so far seems to work. So something that we actually developed in the lab is now helping patients, still a small subset in clinical trials, but hopefully at some point in the future we can actually have this on doctor's prescription. So for the second part of my talk, I want to go to another disorder called DFNA9. And DFNA9 is an autosomal dominant inherited type of hearing loss. Patients also have vestibular function, and this is an adult onset disorder. And there is one specific mutation that's very common in the region of the Netherlands and Belgium that you see in the triangle. Basically, uh, the highest part is Nijmegen, where my institute is based, and all the way here in this Antwerp, uh, Hasselt area of Belgium. And there are a lot of patients with this disorder in that area. And this disorder is caused by mutations in a gene called Koch. And Koch encodes a protein, Cochlin, which is the most abundant protein of the cochlea of our inner ear. It's expressed in almost all cell types. And in the Netherlands and Belgium, we have this founder mutation that's quite frequent that we call P51S. It's a proline at position 51 mutated to a serine. And these patients have normal hearing and balance for up to the age of 30, 35. And then all of a sudden, they start to experience symptoms and decline actually goes quite rapidly. And for the hearing part, we can offer them hearing aids or already quite soon cochlear implants to give them some means of auditory communication. So at this moment, the outlook of these patients is to have some sort of partial hearing uh, restored with these devices and having balance problems until the end of their life. But the thing is, this disorder is that it's a degenerative disease and degeneration continues. And also these patients complain that a cochlear implant is by far sufficient for normal hearing. Unlike patients with Usher syndrome, which are born deaf, these patients with DFNA9 know what normal hearing is like and they know what they're actually missing and they're far more stronger voicing the need for something better. And just as with Ischel syndrome, we have a window of treatment to give them something better. So if we can deliver them a genetic therapy before or very early at the onset of symptoms, we can prevent or delay these symptoms and hopefully create a situation where they have normal or slightly impaired hearing until the end of their life. So another thing that we wondered if these patients are actually wanting that because there are hearing aids, there are cochlear implants. So we are looking at a different type of paradigm where there are treatment options available. We think they're just insufficient. So we did a survey amongst uh, 53 well-informed DFNA9 patients and all expressed very strongly that they would be willing to participate in a gene therapy trial. And even if it were not for their own benefit, but if it would benefit uh, future generations. And that's important because we can develop something in the lab, but if we don't get participants in a clinical trial, then it's all been for nothing. So then to show you what we have been developing, let me first go back to the inheritance pattern. So this is a dominantly inherited disorder. So patients have one mutated copy, and this mutated copy encodes a protein that is toxic to the cells and interferes with the wild type protein, as you can see here. And the solution seems easy. We can just get rid of this protein, and the burden of this protein on the inner ear should be gone. So we can do that with antisense technology at the RNA level, having the RNA masked or degraded, creating a situation, as you can see on the screen, where only one healthy uh, allele is encoding a healthy copy of the protein. And we know the patient should have enough from this protein encoded by a single gene. We've seen it in animal models, and we've seen that in 
patients with loss of function mutations in this gene that they, if they are heterozygous carriers, have no hearing problems whatsoever. So the trick is only, and only is an understatement, to create the situation that you see on screen with antisense technology. So here we use a different method of action of this ASO technology. So if we use an ASO which also has DNA-like properties, we can actually induce degeneration of mRNA, so of transcripts in our cell. And the reason for that is that a DNA-RNA dimer is normally regarded by the cell as potentially toxic in cell division, so the RNA copy is then degraded. And as you can see on the screen, if we introduce a synthetic ASO in a nucleus or in the cytoplasm, it will retract an RNA's H molecule that cleaves the transcript, and this transcript will no longer be translated into a protein. Uh, just as a precaution, I know that these things are also called gapmers. I may use that term in one of the next slides. So what is important here is to discriminate between the mutant and the wild type, because of course we want to get rid of the mutant protein, but not the wild type protein, because we then create an all other problem. And the thing is, on a genetic level, DNA or transcript, the difference is not so big. So here you see the wild type allele, the C position here that's underscored, that's the normal situation. And any therapy model based on antisense technology is almost the same as the wild type situation. And below you see the mutant, and there we have a perfect match. So if for some reason this genetic context is not very amenable to a specific targeting, then we have no plan B. So this is quite tricky and very important to get something therapeutic. So the first thing we did, I considered that basically every genetic variant can be a therapeutic target here. It doesn't have to be the disease-causing mutation. So I used long-read sequencing technology and started to map out what other variants are specific in this mutant Koch gene that are not present in most of our wild-type Koch genes that we see in our patients. And I actually identified 12 variants that are quite rare, and if we would target those, we could actually treat 90% of our patients. And two of these variants are actually not single nucleotide changes, but changes of multiple nucleotides and should be better uh, for specific targeting. What we also noticed is that there are probably another 15 variants that are more common, and they might not be able to serve as a therapeutic target for a lot of our patients with the P51S mutation, but these variants also occur on uh, DFNA9 patients with other mutations. There are 25 other types of DFNA9 mutations that we are not looking into right now. So we could shift our paradigm even and start targeting common variants and no longer looking at the mutation uh, of the patient, but rather looking at the genetic context of the gene that we want to target. So we did some pilot studies in the lab. We engineered a cell line because we could not get a patient cell line that expressed the Koch gene that we are interested in. And we tested several AON molecules or ASO molecules, I should say. And you can see here in black, this is what happens if we deliver a control or a scrambled ASO. So this is basically our standard, no degradation of the transcript. And we tested three different ASO sequences, especially ASOE. It's very active in degrading our mutant Koch transcript. And the gray bar shows the hypothesis that I just showed you, that we could also target other variants on the same gene. But as you can also see, this one was not as effective, so we parked that for now. So we then investigated if this would be specific for targeting the mutant transcript. And indeed, you can see, especially for the ASO B and E, the wild type Koch uh, is not decreased, so we have a specific targeting going on. So we also saw that we did not get rid of all the transcripts from the mutant gene. So we started to increase the dose, and then we saw that if we increase the dose, we also lose some of our specificity. So with increasing doses, we also start to lose some of our wild-type transcripts. But we do get rid of almost all of our mutant transcripts. So this puts us for another challenge. And first of all, working with ASO technology here is an advantage because these are synthetic molecules and we can chemically modify to fine-tune the specificity in a way that's not possible with, for example, uh, genome editing technology of, or siRNA technology. Secondly, we also wondered, and this is not out of laziness, but out of biological thinking, do we actually have to remove all of the protein that's mutated? Because it takes 35 years for symptoms to develop. So for 35 years, the inner ear can cope with this mutant protein. So maybe if we reduce the burden by half, we can extend this to maybe 50 years or 60 years, which would already be a huge benefit for our patients. And secondly, how bad would it be if we lose a little bit of wild type? 
So how much protein from this gene is actually needed for normal function? So these are some questions that we actually do not know and that made us think about how actually to fine tune this process in future therapies. So here we are not, sorry, not at the clinic yet. So at the moment we are investigated, di investigating different ASO chemical modifications to fine tune specificity. We still want to have the bar as high as possible from in vitro studies. And we are moving to in vivo studies that we are hopefully starting soon. So to do this, we've taken a bit of a sidestep and designed a very elegant humanized mouse model. And this mouse model is funded by the Dutch DFNA9 Foundation and the British uh, Royal National Institute for Deafness. And in this mouse model, we introduced the human piece of the Koch gene, as you can see here in blue. But we also wanted to avoid that this uh, human sequence starts to interfere with the function in the mouse context. So every change that distinguishes the mouse protein from the human protein was actually recoded so that we have the human targeting sequence, but the protein is still mouse specific. And you can also see that we introduce not only the mutant part here in exon 3, but a longer stretch so we can test also our hypothesis of targeting other variants on this gene. So this took quite a while, I think two to three years. We have been breeding these animals. We made a mutant uh, humanized mouse. We made a wild type humanized mouse. We've bred them together and now our DFNA9 mouse model is running around and being measured for hearing impairment as we speak. And hopefully we can start treating these mice soon and see if this actually works in vivo. We are this close to signing uh, a research grant from the RNID and also co-funded from the French uh, Fondation pour l'audition. I'm officially not allowed to say that before the contract is signed, but I think we can get there next week. So for this audience, I'm very happy to say that we can progress with this part as well. So to summarize, and mainly also in view of the goal of this meeting, so personalized medicine or semi-personalized. So the cool thing about antisense oligonucleotides is that they act on RNA. This is obvious, but this gives us a whole other paradigm in terms of safety because we remain or we keep the DNA intact. And ASOs have also multiple methods of actions, most notably spice modulation or transcript degradation. And with splice modulation, we can skip loss of function axons and do splice corrections. Of course, some restrictions apply. We've shown it's very active for H2A axon 13. We're looking into other targets. And we can combine actually different mutations and targets in a therapy so that we can keep our patient population high enough to deal with the restrictions that we now see in translating to the clinic, which means it has to be uh, commercially attractive. So there have to be a lot of patients to sell this therapy to, which is not me making money, but we have unfortunately no other option at this moment. So the second mechanism is transcript degradation. So we can silence genes that have negative effects on uh, hearing, for example, where it's very important to distinguish the mutant from the wild type. And here ASO technology is also crucial because we can do these chemical modifications. And I also showed you that we can shift our thinking by not targeting disease-causing mutation, but by grouping patients based on their genomic composition rather than the actual mutation that they have. And hopefully down the line, we can also silence other genes that are not immediately causing a disease, but induce, for example, some sort of beneficial uh, cell response in the ear or maybe even in other organs to restore or improve function of these organs. So in getting this to the patients, the ASO benefits hugely from the proven safety and enormous flexibility in design and chemical modifications so we can get these things on the market quite sooner and at least for now sooner than we can with genome editing technology. So this technology holds an enormous potential for patients with vision loss, for patients with hearing loss and probably for patients with many other inherited disorders as well. And before I would like to take your questions, I want to make a nice bridge to the next section. So we are working on Usher syndrome and DFNA9 for a reason and that's not because we find them so interesting. We have patient advocacy organizations in the Netherlands for Usher syndrome headed by Yvonne, for DFNA9 headed by Arthur, and they are a huge source of inspiration and support for this research. And we are actually in constant connection with them, which is for me, a biologist by training, not the normal situation, at least not in the Netherlands. So for example, from Yvonne, I learned that patients with Usher syndrome also have huge problems with sleeping. And this is always neglected because patients visit an ENT specialist, so an audiologist or a vision specialist, and sleeping problems don't come up. And we now have a research line running to see if we can actually also treat the patients on this level. 
And for DFNA 9 with Arthur, we are doing, of course, the therapy work, and he's been instrumental in finding the way to get this to the clinic. He has hired a consultancy to pave the way, to look at all the things that has to be done, to reach out to the EMA, to see that the mouse studies already are in alignment with what we need to get approval in the future. So by working together with these people, we've actually been able to make steps that we could not make as scientists individually. And I think for this platform, that's definitely worth mentioning. And I'm very proud to, to work together with them. But of course, it's not just me doing the work. Uh, so there's a lot of people involved, most notably Erwin van Wijk, uh, group leader in the Usher syndrome work. I did all the work as a postdoc under his supervision. And with his help and support, I've been able to set up the DFNA 9 research line and start my own lab in Nijmegen. And specifically for DFNA 9, we're collaborating with the University of Antwerp on the mouse work. And of course, there's a lot of funding agencies involved that made all this possible. So with that, I'd also like to thank you and answer your questions if you have any. So, so thank you, Eric, for taking us into this exciting world of ASO therapeutics. Very interesting. So are there any questions to Eric? Hi. Hi. So, wonderful, wonderful uh, lecture. I was wondering, maybe I missed, uh, but I was wondering how do you deliver the therapy uh, for patients uh, that have the ear dysfunction or other organs? Yeah, I didn't really discuss this. So for the vision loss, it's quite easy. It doesn't sound nice, but according to our ophthalmologist, you can just put a needle in the eye and then the molecule travels to the right places. For the inner ear, it's a bit difficult. Uh, you can do it surgically, but these molecules, they have a half-life, so at some point they wear off. We assume somewhere between three and 12 months. And we are now also starting research lines to look for ways to do repeated delivery. So the inner ear is uh, encapsulated in a skeletal structure that's quite difficult to target. There is one weak spot. We know that the ASOs can diffuse over the weak spot, but I think passive diffusion is, well, it's a bit uncontrolled to rely on for therapy delivery. So we're also looking for ways to facilitate the diffusion or to maybe even pass this boundary with a more active uh, delivery agent or micro injection method. And if that would be possible, I mean, it, it's been shown in animal models that the diffusion works, but if we can get enough in there, then it would be very uh, helpful to our patients. So that, uh, that's ongoing research. Uh, stereotactically, our ENT surgeon thinks uh, it's not going to be a problem. Patients can maybe don't even have to be sedated. It can just be uh, a day procedure. So that, uh, yeah, we're combining all things to get this uh, going because it's a bit of a knowledge gap. I think all things pinpoint that it should be possible, but no one's actually shown it at the level of a full-sized ear as we have in humans. So maybe as a follow-up to that question, so systemic administration is not an option? I don't know. So the cochlea and also the retina, just like the brain, has this brain-blood barrier that we call in the inner ear the brain labyrinth barrier. These molecules tend not to pass. Also, probably if they would pass or we could make them pass, the systemic and circulating levels would be so high and these uh, ASOs could have actions throughout the body that is, would not be my preferred method of action. Uh, we have seen some success with this in mouse models. So it, it could be a plan B, but I think we should find a more elegant way. <clears throat> because what is often mentioned when you talk about these kind of, of, of therapies is always formulation and delivery is usually a problem. So it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Monica? Yeah, um, I have a question from, from online. <laughs> so I, I just shared with you, um, Hannah Libeska is asking whether the patients are not afraid of entering their genotype. Their genotype. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the question, so I, I maybe I'm hearing two questions at the same time. If patients are afraid to participate in a trial or if they are afraid to share their genetic data with us, uh, I can discuss both. So we have a huge group of patients that do not have problems sharing their genetic data. Their patients are also actively supporting people to find the genetic diagnosis because it becomes more relevant. And of course, everything in our lab is under the strictest laws of uh, keeping this information private. 
In terms of entering the trials, as soon as we publish anything in a journal, we get a huge amount of emails of people signing up. Even if it's just work in a, in a zebrafish model, they always assume that they can get the molecule uh, delivered to them tomorrow. So we see a lot of interest in people participating in trials as well. Uh, and for DFNA 9, as I mentioned, we also did a survey on that to put this in numbers. So that, uh, that's definitely not an obstacle in, in getting this to the clinic. Okay, maybe I, I, I just add, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, that's my own question, in fact. Uh, also, regarding the patients, um, I was wondering, you said that you made a survey. I think not a lot of researchers are always going also back maybe or contacting, trying to understand the patient perspe perspective before they start the research or maybe at a very late stage. Or, um, and I wanted to know for the survey that you launched, um, those were patients that knew they might get a hear loss. I, I think it was the second uh, example, yeah. right? Uh, or was it, have there been patients that already were affected so they, they understood more how it is to, well, to, yeah. to stop or having a loss of hearing. And then the second question around the same is, how, do we, how are you supported in integrating patients in your research? Uh, would you need support, external support, or are patients participating voluntarily? So how, it's more a funder's perspective mm -hmm. question here. Yeah. So in terms of 50 patients, I think the patients that we included in this survey, they all had a genetic diagnosis of having DFNA9. I don't know if they were all affected. We did this on a patient information day in, uh, in Antwerp where we had about 200 participants, uh, patients, but also family members. And because it's a dominant disorder, it, it's really this type of disorder that runs in the family. So patients always know from a mother or a father having this and an aunt, uncle, grandparent, etc. So if they have the mutation but have no problems yet, they have seen firsthand what the problems are. So I think the ones that attend the day, they really share the same perspective that uh, they're looking for a better treatment. Of course, I must be honest, there's also a subset of people that do not attend these days. They are maybe less informed or just against this type of treatment uh, whatsoever. So we may be a bit biased, but at least we have a subpopulation that we know of that contains at least several hundred patients, I think, nowadays that are interested. And about your funder's perspective, yeah, so this is all, but yeah, we, we don't use a lot of funds in this right now. I also don't know what we would do with extra funding. So the patient organizations, they are very active. They host these days where we talk to them. They invite us uh, whenever one of them is in the clinic. They come over for a coffee that really these low profile uh, meetings are so valuable. You don't need a lot of money for that. Uh, just a good coffee maker, actually, I think is most important. But if you want to formalize that and stimulate that, I think it, it would be good maybe to have some startup funding to, to host a patient day, to, to set this up, to, to get the room ready, to get the catering, to send the invites, to look actively in part, into participants, maybe also host a workshop uh, that they would benefit from. And if you can pay someone for a workshop, if you can pay a venue, it all becomes much more interesting and attractive. I think that would be a great start and then I think a strong patient organization and researchers that are invested actually then are enough to run this, at least on, on a quite proper basis. So. Jean-Luc? Yes, um, it's a, a naive question because I'm totally ignorant in this field and maybe I should not ask it in, in a session which is on, on patient, but uh, these advanced therapies are quite expensive. So at the end, we have to take into account the willingness of the health insurance to pay. And I did not fully understand what is the degree of severity of the second disease that you mentioned, the DFNA. For the first, it was clear to me, but yeah. the second one, I had sometimes the feeling that it was quite mild in, in cases. So who, yeah. who will pay, actually? Uh, I think that's, that's a general issue with hearing loss. Hearing loss seems quite mild to us, and hearing loss has been taken actually out of the medical domain since hearing aids uh, became on the market. In this case, it's a severe progression. People become deaf uh, somewhere during their working life and also become significantly impaired in their balance system. So around the age of 50, they have to stop working. And I've heard also stories from people that are actually stuck at home because walking to the supermarket, taking your bike to a friend, all those things are no longer possible. And they are really uh, handicapped is a word that I actually do not want to use because these are very 
powerful individuals, but they are handicapped and disabled in their means of communication. And their well-being is severely affected. But it's more difficult to put this in number and to sell this to the funding agencies than, for example, something like Usher syndrome or lethal disorder. So that, that's a problem indeed. And gene therapies, even antisense technology, are not cheap. I think that's a general problem that we are facing, <coughs> especially now that we are still relying on commercial companies putting this on the market. Maybe at some point we should start thinking about synthesizing them ourselves in our hospital pharmacies. For many disorders, I think we can do this in a more or less safe way. But maybe that's a discussion for another platform. Another question. I assume for these patients that you need to, it needs to be chronic treatment, lifelong. Yes. And I also assume that it's still too early days so that you don't have really have real world data how the patients feel this, but how do you, do you see what kind of, of toxic effects, side effects, other kind of not so nice things do you expect from these uh, in, in a chronic situation? Yeah, so we don't know a lot about that. I think the first patient was dosed in 2019 and so no problems have occurred yet. Uh, we expect these patients will need a dose somewhere between once and, and three times a year. I don't know for sure. That also depends a bit on what comes of, out of the trial. We do know, of course, for some of the other ASO molecules that have been on the market already for a long time, that these molecules can be quite safe uh, even after systemic delivery. An interesting thing, especially for the eye, the eye is quite immune privileged. So whatever you put in there, there's not as strong an immune response or maybe sometimes not even an immune response compared to what would happen if we do this systemically. So that is an advantage, but you are right. We, we still don't know everything. We can only but, find but the answers But it by seems going that on. The, the learning with using antisense oligonucleotides, it, it, it's pretty safe. So it's... Um, yeah. in, in general, yes. But, yeah. I yeah. mean... Yeah. Yeah. But of course, no treatment is without side effects. So. Yeah, and I think also if it has side effects, and that's, I think, a major benefit of this technology over several other more permanent technologies, you can just stop. Just take your last dose, leave it at that, and maybe something better comes on the market a couple of years later and you can go for that. I hope it's not needed. I hope we have the perfect solution, of course, but I think the fact that it's transient is a big benefit in terms of safety. Because if you deliver something permanent, you will never get rid of it. Yeah, that's true. Well, I have one last question, that is, as I understand it, the, the vision part of Usher's syndrome is the condition called retinitis pigmentosa. Yeah. That condition is also existing in a much broader population, which is not Usher's, not combined kind of with the deafness part. Does your approach also apply to these patients? Yeah, so retinitis pigmentosa can occur as a result of mutations in the H2A gene. That's already quite a big subset, actually. But there are more than 100 other genes that give the same phenotype, and then there is even clinical distinctions beyond retinitis pigmentosa that also leads to more severe or more mild blindness. And some of my colleagues in Nijmegen are doing uh, ASO work for other types of uh, vision problems, mainly splice correction. But there are several other genes of these, this type of large genes with repetitive domains that could be candidates also for exact same approach that we are doing for H2A. Yeah. And we are hoping to extend on that, but of course there's yeah, you cannot do and realize all the plans that come up in your head. I hope yeah, some other people will pick that up as well. But it's great that it can be hope for these patients because there's really no good treatments yeah. for these things. No, there's, today, there's so. nothing else currently. Yeah. yeah, we have a question, I think, going in the same direction. Could ASUS be used for in anti-inflammatory in indications, so targeting signaling pathways? I think in general, yes. So I'm... I believe that ASOs can be used for anything. Uh, it's not like a magic bullet. But because we can determine their method of action by the way we chemically design these molecules, we can interfere with pathways. So for example, many patients get glucocorticoids for uh, disorders like osteoporosis, which was during my PhD topic, but also for uh, inflammatory reasons. These glucocorticoids activate a receptor in our cell that activates a lot of genes. With ASO technology, we could actually bypass this whole signaling pathway and specifically activate or uh, inactivate the genes that are necessary for the therapeutic action without activating the others. I think that's, there, are, there is research going on in that direction. I don't know all the details, but at least it's a possibility of this technology that, uh, if not already, is definitely worth exploring. 
Okay, thank you very much, Eric, for these very, very in interesting and exciting insights. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.